Good evening, folks. This is the sixth ending from our Beacon Pine streams. Don't freeze in rapt attention during speeches in this one. Well, we certainly aren't going to find a grand resolution to our tale locked in a basement. Back to the drawing board. Kenner's Guide to Hostile Interrogation. Hard cop. They'd run the classic good cop, hard cop interrogation. Hard cop. <laughs> Rollo brandished a steely gaze. I've got this. Read about it a hundred times. Rollo swaggered past the chair which propped up the slumping Hiram Tolliver. Without even looking at his captive, he began with a long, blustery drawl. <laughs> I figure just about every phrase that you can conceivably put together has probably had uh, that kind of video made about it, Tess. Without even looking at his captive, he began a long and blustery drawl. Well, 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 Mr. Tolliver. Mr. Tolliver remained motionless. Rollo spun around to face him. He'd clearly expected to rouse Mr. Tolliver with his booming voice. Mr. Tolliver. Beck and Luca gave each other an unsure glance. Rollo slammed his fist on the table. I said... Mr. Tolliver! He grabbed the table lamp and beamed it onto the unconscious face. Mr. Tolliver groaned and slowly <laughs> lifted his head. He recoiled with a muddled, weary squint. What in the world? The chair wobbled as he attempted to straighten up. Who? Who's there? Mr. Tolliver could only make out rough shapes through the glaring light. Weasley has rearranged himself onto my headrest. With a gruff tone, Rollo hoped to both conceal his voice and intimidate. I'll be asking the questions here, punk. Now hold on, let's just calm down. Oh, I am calm. Calm as a carrot in dirt. As for you, looks like you're sweating. The doubtful expression on Beck and Lucas' faces transformed into awe. We can do this my way, or let's just say I've never needed the other way. Rollo, hitting his stride, was now channeling every detective trope his memory could recall. <laughs> every trope. He slammed the table again. Now dance! What? I don't even... Mr. Tolliver's voice became desperate. He was nearly in tears. You tied me down. How on earth could I dance? Dance with your mouth, punk. Spill the beans. What are you doing poking around this house? I'm, I'm here to help Juniper. Make sure everything's ready. Oh, so you're in cahoots with Gran? Gran? Mr. Tolliver was in a daze, now more confused than ever. Gonna help her blow up the festival, huh? Blow up the festival? Good lord. He shook his head, feeling more and more dizzy. No, no, you've got it all wrong. Where is she now? She's headed to the source. Source? What's what's the source? It's where... His voice faded to a whisper. The town began. Where it all began. What is Operation Spark Plug? With that, Mr. Tolliver passed out cold. Rollo swung around with a repentant grimace. Damn, Rollo. I think you went a little too hard on him. What did he say about the source? It's where the town began? We need more information. Yeah, but we'd better not push Mr. Tolliver any further. Is there anyone else who might know more? 
What about the History Museum? It just got set up for the festival. Now that tent was put up by the Valentines. Everything they do is just a bunch of fluff to glorify themselves. Is there anything more reliable? The library? There's anything, any information about this source thing? Uh, Kato can help us find it. Let's go get some answers. First, we gotta talk to Jace. Oh, no. This is a dang nice library. Thanks, we work hard on it. Aren't you a little young to be a librarian? Oh, uh... Kato hung, hung out here so much, eventually they gave him a set of keys. I just keep an eye on the place for Mr. No Miss Novak sometimes. They got you working for free? It's quiet and I get access to all the books I can read. What more could a person want? Fair enough. What can I do for, for you all? We need a favor. I already told you in Rolo. I can't put you any higher on the wait list for the next Hank Atomic. But if you're here with more candy, I'll have you know I can't be bought. Call to personal code of conscience. Actually, we're looking to do some research. Now you're speaking my language. What are you looking for? That's the thing. We sort of don't know. What do you got on the history of the town? Hmm. There's the county record archives. What's in those? Births, deaths, newspaper clippings, stuff like that. Pretty boring reading. But they do go all the way back to when the town was founded. Great, we'll start there. Chapter 8 Six feet under, three towns over. <laughs> the kids spent the rest of the afternoon combing through dusty piles of old county records, desperately searching for anything that could help them make sense of Mr. Tolliver's cryptic utterance. Luca tried to shake the thought of Grand's basement, but his focus wavered. So the kitties get uh, wet food after the stream. And of them, Sammy is the one that is most particular about it. Like, Rorschach is enthusiastic when I bring the wet food down, but Sammy is insistent uh, that, that I go get it. And I just heard her meowing in the background, so uh, she's starting to notice that it's later than normal. Explosives. Messages hidden in jam. Dossiers on various town figures. And a corkboard threaded with photos. Ember has come out to join us. Gran was the only family he had left. He still couldn't bring himself to believe the worst. But the old map with the symbol of explosives in Town Square made that difficult. As the sun began to set, the kids were no closer to the truth. If I have to read any more records, my eyeballs are going to pop. We have to keep digging. If I dig another word, I'm going to end up in one of those asinine death records. Rollo Cotter lived a full and wonderful life till he read so much boring crud that his bra brains oozed out his ears. Rollo shut his book with an assertive nod. If you've got a better idea, spit it out. You sound like my sister. Keep pushing your luck, pal. And it won't be boring county records that kill you. I'll put you in the obituaries myself. Rollo muttered under his breath. You're a county record. <laughs> really? That's the best you've got? When I'm done with you, you'll be the footnote in history. Just like... Slammed her finger down on the open page before glancing... Jay Hartford here. I'd love to see you try. Hey, hey, hey. We're all a little tired here. Let's just take a minute and... Something tickled the back of Luca's mind. Wait, what was that name, Beck? 
in the obit, Jay Hartford. From the Brookville Tribune 20 years ago. That can't be right. What is it? Jay Hartford? That's my grand's name, Juniper Hartford. Maybe there were two Jay Hartfords? Miss Hartford is survived by her young daughter, E. Hartford. My name's mo my mom's name was Eleanor. Okay, this is getting creepy. If your gran is six feet under, three towns over, then who am I living with? The question hung in the air. Yeah, they they they're doing really well with the with the sudden plot beats like this. All right, gang, I got to close up for the night. Beck rubbed her eyes. How late is it? Almost 10. Oh, crap. Pa is going to kill me. I got to go. Yeah, my parents will be worried sick. Okay, let's meet up as early as we can at the festival tomorrow. What are you going to do about the unconscious man in your basement? I'll think of something. Luca's heart was pounding as he approached the house. If he was lucky, Gran, or whoever it was, hadn't gotten back yet. And of course, there was Mr. Tolliver tied up and unconscious in the basement. Dealing with him would be the first order of business. Luca shook out his arms to calm his nerves before entering. He held perfectly still, tempering his breath and to listen closely. She was asleep. His only hope was that she hadn't found Mr. Tolliver before dozing off. It stomp, stomp, stomp right up next to her, but... Gotta check the doors we haven't been able to go through. Oh no. Mr. Tolliver was nowhere to be seen. Maybe he woke up, escaped from his bindings, and left without a trace. Or maybe Gran knew everything. What do I do? Luca's hungry stomach groaned, not realizing it, he'd gone the entire day without eating. Okay, I can figure this out. Just need a little brain food. Luca rushed over to the pile of jam jars, unscrewed one, and shoveled a handful into his mouth. I'm afraid your jam delivery will be delayed. He the lid to read the label. Mr. Nun Creed. Oh, now I can think. So if Gran knows we tied up Mr. Tolliver, I'm screwed. If she doesn't know, then I need to play it cool. Guess the only option is to go to bed and act as if nothing is wrong. Gran will think Mr. Tolliver finished what he was what he was sent sent to do and left when he was done. Now, she specifically sent um, labeled jars to Mr. Tolliver. And Miss Fratelli. And she had extra ones ready for Mr. Nuncreed, uh, who claimed that the stuff was flying off the shelves. And he specifically ate some that was for Mr. Nuncreed. I wonder if she's been doing anything to Nuncreed's jam. Because Nuncreed seems to be involved with uh, perennial harvest. Ran. Okay, stick to the plan. Go to bed, play it cool. As Luca climbed the final stair, the emotion of the day dragged heavily on him. With each consecutive step, his legs weakened. A little string instrument drag <laughs> during this. His stride began to falter. He tried to grab for the railing to steady himself. Something was wrong. Yep, poison jam. A few more steps. 
Luca groaned and tried to move. His limbs might as well have been bolted to the ground. Through numb lips, he mumbled just before falling asleep. The germ? Sweet boy. What did you get yourself into? Rest now and let me handle everything. Poisoned germ. A speech to end all speeches. Luca awoke to find himself face down in bed. He moaned into his pillow. Why would Gran drug him? <laughs> Why would Gran drug him? It's like, okay. Or rather, why was there she we trying go. to drug Mr. Nuncreed? Shaking the questions from his woozy head, Luca snapped back to the matter at hand. The festival. I feel like your motivations have suddenly gone askew, child. Where have you been? I, uh, Gran put something in the jam. Yeah, we know. Secret messages for secret conspirators. Not this one. The one intended for Mr. Nuncreed put me to sleep. Oh, ho, ho. Sly devil. <laughs> oh, every one of the pictures on the, the, the charms is excellent. Just excellent. I think she's trying to remove him from the equation. He might be in danger. Have you found anything? We looked around, but haven't seen anything odd. Your gran is nowhere to be found. But Mr. Nuncreed is just loafing around waiting for the speech. What speech? Mayor Gus just got up, got up to the podium. Everyone is gathering at the stage. Let's get moving. Augustus Valentine nervously wiped his brow. The swarm of little bunny children over there on the right. Ahem. Is this thing... Uh, hello, Beacon Pines. I'm Augustus Valentine, your mayor, and I suppose you already know, already know that. Um, oh yes, before we get started... I just wanted to take a moment to recognize someone who couldn't be here today. This town wouldn't be where it is today without my father, Sharper Valentine. So I thought we could begin with a round of applause befitting such a great man. Even that's more than that old codger deserved. Gus cleared his throat and awkwardly loosened his tie. Right, where was I? William Kerr bounded on the stage with the energy of a preacher at a big tent revival. <laughs> Gus Valentine, everyone. He gave Gus a hearty slap on the back and motioned him off the stage. Get off the stage, you're killing the energy. Let's hear it for our mayor. What a great turnout. Aw, oh, heck, I didn't prepare anything. But I suppose I could say a few words. It would be a shame to waste such a beautiful podium. Mr. Kerr pulled a thick stack of note cards out from his vest. <laughs> Community. Conviction. Commitment. These are the things we celebrate at Perennial Harvest. For us, these are the pillars of the, of the bridge to a better tomorrow. But I think it's time to add a new pillar. Change. Change is a powerful thing. It's inex inex inexorable, unavoidable, and undeniable. And I am dadgum thankful for it. 
Change is the reason we're all together today. It's hard for me to believe that it was only four years ago when fate brought me here. A simple business trip which brought me to a small town, which would change my life forever. Mr. Kerr took a moment to survey the crowd. You know what? He wiped away a single tear. <laughs> On the second I set foot in Beacon Pines, something about this place has held me captive. You see, change represents opportunity. Has anyone here ever been to a, like, a tech training session or similar where they get somebody to come up on stage and, like, really rile you up for whatever product they're selling or whatever new management paradigm they're trying to uh, convince you is the better one? This guy has that energy. I really expect him to have an earpiece and one of those little... Little little mini microphones. Really be running around the stage. It was change that helped me recognize the potential of this place. To see that the people of this town, despite suffering great loss, still held on to the things that made them special. He thumped the podium to emphasize each word. Community, conviction, commitment. Change. Mr. Kerr nodded confidently, biting his lip. The crowd was silent, in rapt attention. Fate made the made a perfect match that day. Nothing is more important to you all than community. And perennial harvest is a community first and foremost. Mr. Kerr methodically. It, made if a business ever tells you they're a community, them. that's usually the time to run. The only way you made it through the foul harvest was an unshakable conviction. A conviction that a bet that a better tomorrow was just over the horizon. <laughs> Perennial harvest is founded on the conviction that we are that horizon. This festival is a symbol of our commitment to each other. His voice began to build to a crescendo. We now walk hand in hand into the future we will shape together. And that is what change is all about. Grabbing the future by the scruff of the neck and making things happen. Change is a choice. A choice you have to grab firmly and violently shake to make a point. I am tickled pink that we will all be making that choice together. How great is that? Just imagine what we can accomplish. Boom. What was that? The crowd began to look around nervously. Don't worry, a little thunder isn't going to ruin this day. Everyone remain calm. Mr. Kerr quickly flicked through his note cards. Where was I? Through all of my travels, I've I have learned one true thing. One always reaps what they sow. We have all planted a lot of good in this town, and so it is with a happy heart that I can proclaim He raised his hands up to the heavens. Our harvest awaits. And everybody's frozen again. At that moment, a merciless wall of impossibly cold air ripped through the crowd, instantly freezing everyone and everything it touched. For a man like William Kerr, this was a fitting way for things to end. On a stage, with an entire town frozen in rapt attention for the rest of time. The end. I mean, a whole lot less poignant than the treehouse everything is frozen for eternity moment. Thanks for watching, folks. I hope you enjoyed it. Let me know in the comments and remember to like and subscribe for more.